Welcome to Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along. I'm the Bad GM, Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide as we build an entire campaign for your group from scratch. From a starting location to character creation and scenario building. As you are already aware, we're using the Deadlands Classic system, and any reference we make to the books in that line are for entertainment purposes only, as they are trademarked and copyrighted properties of Pinnacle Entertainment Group. Now, normally I dive straight into the recap of what we created last week, but I need to detour before we do that, because I've gotten a few notes from our listeners pointing out a few things I left out of last week's show. First off, it was noted that while I gave templates for use for one of Francis Colson's three associates, I didn't do so for the other two. I'd say you could use either the Gambler template or the Shyster. Either one would work well for what you need. Also, it was pointed out that one of the associates was supposed to tell the group where Colson has his money stashed as a condition of being allowed to walk away. It's the second National Bank of Denver, but that information is only going to give them the bank. Actually being able to get to the money is an entirely different thing, and we'll address that in the creation portion of today's show. The third and final thing I missed last week is a pretty big one. I noted near the start of last week's show that the scenario we were creating was a pretty role-play intensive scenario, and I promised to help you figure out how to engage your players who might not be into that. And then I didn't do it. So let's take a moment or two today to discuss ways to get the non-role-playing members of your group engaged in the session. One school of thought on that subject is not to really worry much about it. I would note that in this particular campaign, we have a lot of combat. So I'd be more worried about your role-play intensive players than those who aren't. But I've also noticed that the role-play intensive folks tend to adapt better to a combat-rich environment than the other way around. And for me, a bored player in a serious role-playing situation can be frustrating because they frequently want to give the answer they think will lead to action the fastest rather than the one that's the most appropriate to both the situation and their character. So, my school of thought is to pull that player aside before the session even begins and let them know what's up. Explain to them that there's not going to be a lot of combat, if any, and then help them try to understand that the situations in this scenario can be viewed as a different sort of combat as the players are going to have to outwit the bad guys to try to get what they want. Now, I'll admit that doesn't always work, but if you can figure out a way to explain what's going on as some sort of a challenge to be overcome, I've typically had good success with my non-role-playing characters. To balance that, I also give them a bit of free reign to walk away from the table more than I normally would, so they can clear their head and be ready for what's next. This, of course, is just a suggestion. You do what you think will work best for your players. By the way, I know I've been saying that a lot the past couple of weeks, but there's a reason for it. By this point in your game, even if you're a first-time GM, you should have a pretty good feel for your players, their characters, and how they're going to play and kind of what they're looking for. So while I'm building up the scenario for you, I'm also intentionally starting to leave more parts open for you to fill in yourself. That's so that you can tailor what we're doing to your specific group. Now don't worry, we're not stopping the show anytime soon. We've still got a decent amount of story to tell, and I intend to help you tell the whole thing. Also, at any point, should you feel free to strike out on your own, do it. What I mean is if you've got the stuff you want to do for your group, do it. Believe me, the only way you're ever going to get good at creating your own stuff is to create your own stuff. Sometimes it's a rousing success, and sometimes it's a smelly fart. I've been writing my own stuff for the better part of 20 years, and I can assure you I still drop a lot of smelly farts when I'm writing. So don't be afraid to do it if you've got an idea you want to run with. Okay, so with our errata covered and the pep talk complete, let's recap what we created last week, shall we? Last week, our group was newly arrived in Denver. They found themselves trying to figure out the best way to find either the banker or Francis Colson. After some thinking, they came up with three thoughts. Check the taverns, check the banks, check the hotels. So after they got their own accommodations taken care of, they decided to start with taverns. And to help them with this, they decided to bribe or pay some of the street kids of Denver. It took a couple days, but they finally got a lead. Turns out it's one of Colson's associates, Philip Conway. They ran into him inside the Spotted Dog Tavern, and after tailing him out of the tavern, they were able to get him into an alleyway and get some information out of him. He's the quartermaster for the Colson Corporation, and as such provided weapons for all of the attacks on Triumph. He also told the group Colson wouldn't sleep in the same hotel two nights in a row. To that, he added that Colson wouldn't stay in anything other than a fine hotel. He also gave the names of the other two associates of his that are in town, Roger Grant and Tobias Allen, but he didn't know where they were or what they were doing. This led to the group scouting banks. 
Again, it took about five days before their work paid off, and they ran into Roger Grant. Once again, they tailed him until they got him into an alleyway, and then they got more information. He was the logistics guy for the corporation. He also told the group that Colson wouldn't be caught dead in anything less than a top-notch hotel. He also gave the name of the other two associates and added that he had no idea what they were doing. There's the theme here. He also dropped a bomb on them. The banker isn't actually a banker. It's an alias Colson and the banker used to keep prying eyes off of them. So, with taverns and banks out of the way, that left hotels. Through the information they got, they were able to narrow the choice of hotels down to two and they staked them out. After a week of staking out hotels, they got Tobias Allen. He is, was, Colson's right-hand man. He'd also been ordered to not leave the hotel except to eat, which is what he was doing when the group caught him. He knows where Colson keeps his money, and he offered that up to keep himself alive and out of jail. He told him that Colson isn't staying in a hotel, but he thinks he might have a house or other place to stay somewhere around the First National Bank of Denver, since that's where Colson's safety deposit box is. And yes, I'm aware he's got his money in one bank and a box in another. That's intentional. Alan gives the group a key to the box, and that's where we wrapped our show. Okay, so as we get to building this week, the group has two options. Go to the second national bank and see if they can find Colson, Or go to the first national bank and check the safety deposit box. First off, the group needs to ask Alan a question or two, since they still technically have him as we start the game. Specifically, they need to know if Alan himself has access to the money and or the safety deposit box. The truth is, he does. They might also ask if Alan has actually ever been to either bank. He has not. Colson, he says Colson put his names on the account just in case. So with that out of the way, we need to examine what they choose to do first. Logic dictates the First National Bank is a much smarter choice, since they can do it right now and possibly get some information they can use to try to find Colson. So we refer back to last week when we made it a point to make sure that any of our group who are heading to the bank being appropriately dressed for the bank in question. In other words, if you're going to be in an area with money, make sure you look like you belong. Kind of reminds me of when I was in high school and a buddy of mine and I decided to take his dad's old, and I mean very old, pickup truck to a very exclusive mall in our metro area. By the way, the very good friend is Scott, who plays in my game today. Anyway, needless to say, we did not look like we belonged, and it was obvious mall security picked us up as soon as we got there and stayed with us until we left. So that is a real-world example of why it is important to look like you belong. Once the group figures out which one of them is impersonating Alan and who's going with them, if anyone, they can head off to the First National Bank to check that box. Now, getting into the bank is easy. Getting a bank official's attention about the box is easy. However, the official is going to ask a lot of questions. This official is an older gentleman, and it's obvious he's not only from money, but also very well educated. It would be easy to assume that he's the son of a lawyer or a banker, and he's working his way up the ladder to perhaps running his own bank at some point. For any roles concerning our bank official, use the shyster template from the Banker's Guide. Which will tell you what I feel about bankers. Also, I suppose we should name this fellow. Let's call him Arthur Benson. He asks the obvious questions. Name, relation to Mr. Colson, reason for accessing the box. However, he drops one on the group that they hadn't considered. There's a security question Colson put in for access to the box. Turn me on my side and I am everything. Cut me in half and I am nothing. What am I? So the players are going to want to make rolls to figure this out. I say don't let them do it immediately. Tell them they have to figure it out on their own before they can make any rolls to try to figure anything out. And give them as much time as they need. Now there's one more thing to note. Anybody whose character isn't in the bank cannot help with the question. That's going to be the hard part. I mean, it's only fair. Those who are there know the question and can try to answer it. And that leads to an issue. What do you do if someone who isn't there tries to help or blurts out the answer? All right, there, there's a couple of ways to address this. The first one would be to either ask anyone not in the bank to leave the room until to call back in or take a bathroom break, a snack break, whatever. Then you can just run this over with the people that are left. The other option is if you've only got one or two in the bank, you take them out of the room and have it work it out with them, and then you keep them there until it's solved. Maybe let them bring a piece of paper and a pen, obviously some dice. If you choose to leave everyone in the same space and someone who shouldn't be helping helps, the level of punishment should just depend on how serious you want it to be. I mean, if, if something like that really doesn't bother you, then just let it go. Don't do anything. Otherwise, you could penalize the character by taking away a fate chip. I mean, doing good things rewards you with chips. Ergo, deliberately ignoring the GM's request or decision should cost a fate chip. 
I mean, I can't think of anything else I would consider to be reasonable as a punishment. Of course, as usual, if you've got a thought on this that you're more comfortable using, then go with it. And hey, let me know what it is. Anyway, for the record, the answer is eight. And after thinking about it for a bit, if those trying to solve it are having that much trouble, allow their characters to make knowledge checks with a target of six. If they succeed, give them hints. The only way I'd allow a player to be given the answer is to get like an 18 or higher on that roll. Otherwise, use hints like infinity and zero, or think of a number. Anyway, they should be able to figure it out if they think long enough. Heck, your group might get it right off the bat. Oh, and this is something specific to Gabe Gentleman. Since I know you listen to the show each and every week, just know I'm changing the question for when I run this next week. So don't worry about memorizing the puzzle, big boy. So once they answer the question correctly, Mr. Benson will take them to the safety deposit box vault, then use his key with their key to extract the box. He takes them to a small booth off to the side and pulls curtains to give them some privacy while they examine the contents of the box. There's a stack of papers in there, and while you can type up some of them if you're into handouts for your group, the basics are this. One of them says, Banker, Butcher, Baker, Candlestick Maker, Muffin Man, Snake Oil Salesman, Undertaker. Another paper has a name on it with some information. Banker, Jonathan O'Toole, Denver, Colorado. Mayor, 14%, Colorado, Kansas. Butcher, Zebediah Thomas, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Albuquerque Daily News, 14%, New Mexico, Texas. Another sheet has musings written on it. Obviously, the names are aliases. I know Banker because I was there when he chose it. I know Zebediah is the butcher because I've met with him before. Rumors are the baker is based in Sacramento. Snake oil salesman is supposedly not a white man. Makes sense as an alias if you think about it. Candlestick maker, muffin man, and undertaker. I have no idea. Maybe Jonathan or Zebediah knows one of them. There's one more sheet of paper in there. It's a note, obviously not in Colson's handwriting. Dear Francis, we've been very lenient with you concerning how you run your outfit. We even looked the other way when you decided to call it the Colson Corporation. However, you've been taking too many chances recently. Between the actions in Wichita and El Paso, combined with that awful business in Buzzard's Peak, you are drawing too much attention to yourself. Triumph was the final straw. The board is convened and it has been decided that you are out. You can do this the easy way or the hard way. For your sake, I hope you choose the easy way. Banker. The group can take the papers and then return the box to its spot. And then, of course, they're going to want to discuss what they found and take a second to digest it. So let's take a moment to look back on what we know about the backers of the Colson Corporation to this point. It was said that a cabal of wealthy men were funding Colson's activities and that they covered Kansas, Colorado, and New Mexico. We also know, because the players learned it last time out, that the banker was an alias for someone and that Colson knows who the banker is. So we can safely assume, based on what we've seen here, that Colson has the identities of two of these men with aliases. So what's the rest of the information? Obviously, Colson has spent time trying to figure out who all seven of these men, who apparently call themselves the board, are. He's got two, but he wonders if he's got a line on another. The letter appears to be from the banker. Obviously, if Colson's intel is right, the banker is the mayor of Denver. Don't know what the group's going to want to do with that little piece of knowledge, but they've got it to work on. And obviously, feel free to change things up a bit to make it more your style. So, with the bank out of the way, your group might want to go check on the money, especially if they're broke. My group isn't, and you'll find out why in a couple of minutes, but yours might be. So it's a virtual repeat of what we just did. However, this time it'll be the teller they'll need to speak with, Her name is Gladys McAllister, and while she seeks confirmation questions about Alan, there isn't a security question. She also seems confused since Mr. Colson was in here a couple of days ago and withdrew all of his money. If pressed, she'll add that he said something about how beautiful Montana is this time of year. So there's no money, but they do have a lead on Colson if they feel like going to Montana. And honestly, if that's even where he went. So they came up goose eggs on the money. What's next? There's several options here for the group to consider. One option would be to follow the lead on the banker. After all, they're already in Denver, so seeing what's what on that one would be, from a traveling perspective, prudent. However, they have to keep in mind that they're considering going after the mayor of Denver, Colorado. He is bound to be surrounded by our men. Plus, if he is a part of this board, whatever it is, he's probably got some people around him that are a little extra nasty. They've got the option to head off to Albuquerque and chase down the butcher. They've got his name and his vocation, so that's also an option. There's also the option to head off to Montana to try to hunt down Francis Colson. 
But the group can't be 100% certain Coulson's headed there. I mean, after all, and this is going to probably occur to somebody in the group, no role needed, that if Coulson thought someone was tailing him, it's kind of convenient he blurted out his next destination. So for the moment, let's put Montana on the back burner. Regardless of what their thoughts on the situation are, at some point as they move through town, a boy who appears to be from the poorer section of town approaches him. He gives the name of one of the group members and asks if that's the person he's speaking to. When it's confirmed, he says he was told to find the group and deliver a letter, which he passes on to the group member in question. The letter reads, I hear you've got quite the quandary. I might be able to help you if you're willing to trust me for a half an hour. Meet me at 7 p.m. sharp. 3325 National Street, Denver, Madam Teresa. I think this is a good place to wrap our creative portion of the show today. I've got a little design thinking to do before we continue. Plus, next week's show will be creation only, so we'll get a lot out during that show. So, as we typically do, let's shift gears and get to the game debriefing from my group. Now, since it's been two weeks since the last time we met, let's cover what they did their last time out. First off, I reported a couple of changes in the players of the group. Jim has announced he won't be a consistent player due to job obligations, and we added a new player, Tyler, to the group. As we began the session, our original five were on a train headed north from Tombstone towards Tucson, Arizona. They were seated in the same section of the train as Tyler's character, which gave them an opportunity to get to know each other. Once they got to Tucson, they were accosted by a man who said Gabe's character stole money from him. He and his five associates attacked the group, and Tyler figured out before anyone else that the associates were walking dead. Scott used his power to find out the guy got something special from the widow to control his walking dead. After taking some serious wounds, the group succeeded and found out that the widow and her group of cowboys appeared to have not come to town. But as they were discussing this with the local law, a horse dragging a deputy county sheriff came galloping through. The deputy had both eyes blown out, and using his power, Scott learned it was the widow who did it. The group headed north in an attempt to hunt her down. They came across the camp, and all of the cowboys were dead. They'd been poisoned. Again, using his powers, Scott learned that the widow poisoned the cowboys and was headed east to meet the group in triumph, and that she intended to raise an army to deal with them when she got there. The group decided that they could get ahead of her if they backtracked, so they returned to Tucson and then took a train to Tombstone. From Tombstone, they took a train to El Paso, but decided to go check on the fort outside of town before catching the train north to Albuquerque. They found the fort, which had been full of walking dead, empty. Knowing that, they caught their train to Albuquerque, then took the Santa Fe Trail to Triumph. They saw a ton of smoke as they approached, and when they got there, the town was burned to the ground. Checking things out, they found the proprietor of the entertainment house, nailed up on the entryway to the town, gutted and with a note in her mouth. The note read, I changed the deal, Francis Colson. Before they could react, 20 walking dead came up on them. They dealt with them, but took some serious injuries. However, a Native American shaman seemed to appear out of nowhere, announced he'd been sent to observe the situation in triumph, and healed those hurt the worst before fading off into the night. Very angry at this point, the group rode hellbent for leather for the Colson compound, and when they got there, they found the entire place basically blown away. While they tried to figure out their next move, a hooded figure approached them, as everyone drew down on it, it slowly produced a letter, laid it on the ground, snapped its fingers, and disappeared. The letter read, Sorry, you Mr. Chance boys. See you in Denver. The Widow. And that's where we pick up with this week's debriefing. I need to note before we start that I had Jim's character leave the group after the big fight in Tucson. The reason I gave was that he had a personal bounty to hunt down, and he didn't tell the group because what they've got going on is important enough that they need to keep on working on it. So, for now, Jim's character has been written out of the game. Also, Tyler wasn't present for this week's session, and that's okay. These things happen from time to time. The group is still standing in what used to be the Colson Corporation's compound. It's empty, and the widow seems to have found a way to just disappear. Since she's basically taunted them to meet her in Denver, they decided that Denver was where they were going. They decided, though, that it would be faster to catch a train to Denver from Dodge City. They rode north for five and a half days, and throughout the ride, they came across dead men wearing the uniform of the Colson Corporation. Scott made it a point to inform me at the first sighting they were putting bullets in the heads of all of the dead men so as to avoid any of them rising as walking dead. They got to Dodge, immediately entered the train depot as they approached from the south like we discussed in last week's design session. However, they never left the depot. After a deputy town marshal pointed out they needed to check their weapons, they decided to rest in the depot for three and a half hours to wait for their train to arrive. They bought their tickets on Union Blue and were on that side of the depot. 
Gabe noticed a couple of men in Colson Corporation uniforms going into and out of the station on the Black River side a few times, but the group wasn't spotted and they decided to not take action. For the record, that was an attempt on my part to get them to take some action, and I know they figured it out and decided it wasn't worth it. That's okay. Again, it happens from time to time, and while they would have gotten a bit of information that would have helped them in Denver, it really wasn't the end of the world. They caught their train for Denver, and everything went fine until they were just starting to climb the mountain. At that point, the train came to a complete stop, and a Union soldier, who had been aboard as a guard for the train, announced that it appeared there were some men who were going to try to rob the train. The group asked if the soldiers needed help, and just as the soldier was responding that they had everything under control, he took a bullet to his head. With that, the group agreed that their help was needed. The combat went well for the group, because none of them got hit. At some point during the fight, they realized the bad guys were going to try to blow the door open on what everybody believed was a bank car. The charge went off, and the group heard someone yell out, You didn't use enough dynamite! The group managed to finish off the bad guys, and Scott and Aniston decided to try to figure out where that additional dynamite might be. They noticed a wagon a few hundred yards off with the horses tied, and when they approached, the wagon was filled to the brim with U.S. Army-issued dynamite. They took a few sticks for themselves, then used the horses to help the engineer and fireman clear the tracks. While this was going on, Gabe noticed a wounded Union soldier dragging his way through the car. He said he just needed to get to the next car, and Gabe asked if there was a doctor in there. The soldier confirmed that there was, and Gabe assisted the soldier to the car. They knocked, and it was obvious this car was made of some sort of steel. A sliding panel on the door opened, and a man looked out at the soldier. Both he and Gabe said something about the soldier needing a doctor, and the man slid the panel closed. The door opened a few minutes later, and Gabe got a look at a man who appeared to be a doctor. However, he was cuffed to a chair and appeared to be very nervous. The other man in the car was dressed in a black suit with a black tie and a black bowler hat. He eyeballed Gabe and told him, You saw nothing. You heard nothing. You know nothing. And he closed the door on Gabe, who returned to his seat. A few minutes later, the entire group was back in their seats, and the train continued on its way to Denver. As the group discussed what they saw and found after the fight, Gabe subtly made it clear that what he saw he could not discuss on the train. Also, shortly before the train stopped in Denver, he saw the soldier walk back through the train as if nothing had happened. He appeared to have never been shot. Finally, they arrived in Denver. Wisely, they stowed their long guns and figured out how to conceal their pistols, as I made it very clear to them that open carrying would be a bad idea. They decided to get hotel rooms in the middle-class section of town so as not to draw too much attention to themselves, and immediately set out for the wealthy part of town to look for the widow. Their reasoning for that is they figured out she'd be hanging out with the high class and wealthy, as those are typically her types of targets. So they made their way from tavern to gambling hall to hotel, and of course they kept striking out since they were basically just wandering around hoping to hit a target. At one point, Scott stepped in the middle of the street and called out, Okay, we're here, show yourself. With that, a kid, obviously from the poor section of town, approached and asked Scott his name. When he confirmed it, the kid told him he had a letter for him. Scott took the letter, tossed the kid a coin, then opened it and read it. It said, I propose a meeting tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., the widow. It had an address on it, but I hadn't come up with one prior to game time, so the group just went with it. They went to a tavern in the rich part of town and inquired about the address on the letter. They were told it was on the northern edge of town and that it's a gated, rather exclusive community. The group decided to check it out and headed that way. They found out that, indeed, it is gated and there are only five houses as a part of the community. Happy that they knew where they were doing, they decided to head back to the middle class district and partake at a tavern. Gabe and Aniston decided to do a little gambling while Scott had an errand to run. For the record, Gabe won about 20 bucks while Aniston broke even. Scott pulled me aside to tell me what he was doing. First, he went to a tobacco shop and purchased cigars. Next, he found a tailor still open and asked for custom pouches to be sewn into the lining of his vest to hold his cigars with a new pouch sewn in for his lighter. The tailor agreed to it and had it done in a short amount of time. Once that was all done and the group was back together, they noticed a man at the end of the bar they were sitting at was drinking, obviously drunk, and even more obviously oblivious. He was also wearing a nicer version of the Colson Corporation uniform, and Gabe and Scott recognized him from their meeting with Francis Colson as he was one of three men in the room with Colson when they entered. When the man got up and staggered off into the night, the group followed him at a distance. I was quietly making rolls at the table and at one point decided that he needed to pee, so he turned off into an alleyway. That's when Scott decided to strike. He got up on the man and held a knife to his privates while he started asking questions. 
They find out they've got Philip Conway, the quartermaster for the Colson Corporation. The group really wanted to kill him, but Scott instead tried to get him to kill himself as a sort of penance for all the innocent lives that were taken in triumph. He was using his skills to try to accomplish this, but Conway rolled better on his rolls and wouldn't do it. He did hold up a little vial that he said was given to him by Colson to use if we're captured or going to jail, but it was obvious he wasn't going to use it. He spilled that he'd been ordered to stay in his hotel and await orders from Colson, but it had been a while. He was bored and he wanted a drink. Otherwise, he had no idea where Colson or anyone else in the corporation is. Scott and Gabe started working on him, and through a number of roles, plus a healthy amount of knife intimidation, he was convinced to start redeeming himself, and Conway wandered off to start a new life. Or anyway, that's what everybody thinks. The group decided to have more drinks, then they turned in for the evening. In the morning, they readied themselves for their meeting, and Scott handed me a note letting me know that the modifications for his vest hadn't been for cigars. He had dynamite in the vest tied together with the main fuse in his lighter pocket. In other words, he had assembled a suicide vest. So they made their way to the appointed address and showed their letter to the guard. He pointed out the house that they were to go to. It was on the northeastern end of the line and told them they'd have to show the letter to yet another set of guards there. They did and were granted access to the estate. The house was a two-story Victorian style home that appeared to also have an attic. They made their way to the door, knocked, and were greeted by an older looking gentleman dressed like a butler. He welcomed them in and escorted them to the sitting room. He asked if they wanted anything to drink, then brought a decanter of whiskey and five glasses. Wary of the widow, since they all knew she's poisoned people before, Scott asked the butler if he was paid well and taken care of. More to the point, he ultimately asked the butler to join them in a drink. He grabbed a sixth glass, poured some, took a drink, then finished his glass. When they were satisfied he wasn't dead or dying, some of the group chose to sip their drinks. A few moments later, the widow made her way in, dressed in morning attire. And that's morning as in AM, not like sad. She acknowledged being very aware that all five men were more than willing to put a bullet in her head, and she admitted that she couldn't blame them. However, she wanted this meeting to be a business meeting and just wanted to talk. She and the group began to admit some truths. The group agreed that they did want to kill her for the things she did, but the widow pointed out things they didn't know. The deputy sheriff she killed north of Tucson was a serial killer from Kansas City. The cowboys she poisoned, well, they're very bad men. The associates of Colson's she's killed were also very bad men. She admitted that she's associated herself with Colson in the past, but she could no longer do so in good conscience. When confronted, she states that she is aware of triumph, and she was trying to get there ahead of Colson because she was afraid he'd try something like that. When she couldn't get there, she made her way to the compound and destroyed it. She thought she'd got him, but she was wrong. The group even asked her about the kidnapped family from the beginning of the campaign. She reminded them that what they'd heard about her being responsible for came from the mouths of Colson employees, which means it had come from the mouth of Francis Colson. She does admit that she'd hired the group to find the family, but it was to protect them. Her intentions were good, even though the money was counterfeit. She admits to that, but notes that she didn't have enough time to get enough real cash together to do the deal. As the conversation goes on, it comes out that she's much older than it seems. She makes comments about having been around to see the fall of the Roman Empire. She admits to having a Manitou in her head, though hers is much older and much more different than those running around today. They also realize quickly that she's got definite control of it. For the record, I see the widow is sort of a lich, to use a term more of you might be familiar with. Instead of a phylactery, we're using a Manitou. She does admit to giving the guy in Tucson the potion to control Walking Dead, but she also states she had no idea he was going to attack the group. Needless to say, she makes a point during the conversation to admit that, at first, she saw the group as a threat of bad guys. And while she admits to killing people, she only kills those who are truly bad, those who deserve it. Once she realized she was wrong about the group, she decided to meet with them to call some sort of truce. As a show of good faith, she's going to get the group rooms at the plaza. She also makes it a point to state that she's looking for Colson, but she needs to lower her profile. She's been in America too long, and she's made too much noise. Scott sees this as a contract, and he asks what's in it for the group. Early in the conversation, after everybody had laid their guns out on the table in front of them as a show of good faith, the widow had given Gabe an envelope with $20,000 of his money that she stole. After Scott asks his questions, she gives Gabe another envelope with $19,500 of his money. She admits that I had to pay a couple bills with it. She offers to give the group a $5,000 line of credit with Smith and Robards, and with Scott presses for more, she admits she believes she, or her voodoo benefactor anyway, can help Scott rid himself of the voices of the dead. 
He thought about it for a minute, but he declined. Instead, she's going to get them talismans of protection. All right, so before I continue, at this point, you're probably wondering why I'm not only giving the money back, but giving them this cool stuff. Well, look, while they can buy a ton of cool stuff, that cool stuff alone isn't going to be enough to deal with the bad guys I have in mind moving forward. Just think of it like this. If the group has it, chances are the bad guys have a better version of it, or at least more of it. Anyway, the group agreed to the deal. The widow provided them with the hotel that they needed to check for a Tobias Allen, who is the right-hand man of Coulson. He has a key for Coulson's safe deposit box, and she flat out states that what's in that box will make it more than worth your while. She also asks that the group send her a message when they've got Coulson, and she'll meet with them for their payment. Oh, and earlier in the conversation, when upgraded accommodations were discussed, the widow pointed out that it wouldn't be in her house because there were things there that like to try to possess those that stayed in it. So that's why she was getting hotel rooms for the group. One final note, as they were leaving, Scott decided to place his hand on the ground to try to get a feel for what was there. I mean, if there's stuff that wants to possess, he wants to know what it is. I had him make a roll. He barely succeeded. Basically, I told him he'd felt pure evil and had barely escaped its grasp. And as he took that in, we wrapped the session. All right, so next week we build some more campaign. And without a debriefing to do, it's going to be all about the creation. As always, I encourage you to check out our other podcast, Role Playing History. This week, we conclude our three-part episode on the world of darkness by taking a look at the books contained in the Chronicles of Darkness. Role Playing History is available wherever you get your podcasts. All of the books we used in this podcast are the copyrighted and trademarked properties of Pinnacle Entertainment Group and are used here for entertainment purposes only. The music we use for this show comes from Pixabay.com. Check them out for your license-free, royalty-free music for your next project. Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along is a production of Bad GM Productions. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Bad GM Productions. Twitter at Bad GMP. YouTube Bad GM Productions. Twitch Bad GM. And you can email us at Bad GM Productions at gmail.com. Next week, we continue our adventures in Denver, or maybe Albuquerque, or maybe Montana. Eh, no matter what, it's going to be fun. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, the Bad GM.